We're joining the live stream. Um, is that right, Alan? Yeah, we're joining the live stream too. And I've got Jonathan with me, um, who is going to be talking about the, the, the project um, and doing the welcome for the rest of the speakers. So if we can all kind of get ready to listen, um, that'd be amazing. Jonathan, do you want to take a seat on the stage? I'm going to hang around the front. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan. And um, I don't do written speeches. What I want to start with is to welcome everybody to this place, and firstly, to thank the National Library team, who have been wonderful. They've worked so hard to get to where we are right now. And again, we have lots of our partners in the room. 
the WE Museum, who we've worked with, and lots of other organizations and individuals. I'm here today in the capacity of a director for Inkula Wellness, and I just want to introduce a few people, Inkula Wellness directors. If you're anywhere, if you're already here, please put up your hand for recognition. There's a few. All right, okay. Maybe I'll just wear it. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So I'll give you a brief story about how we started. And uh, personally, I love communities. I like working with people. And that's something that connects me with, very well with everybody. So Enclosure Wellness started in COVID, when we had people not going anywhere. And it started as a fitness group, providing free sessions for families who are unable to go to the gym, young people who are finding it difficult, and all what we did is Africans approached me and my other colleagues, and we just had sessions in the park. We addressed mental health issues, fitness issues, and then as time went on, we realized that there's a lot of conversations people are sharing with us. And these conversations weren't just about COVID. It's the stories of people coming from Africa to get where they are. They've made Scotland home. They wanted to contribute to Scotland. And some of them didn't know how to do that. And we became a voice for those people who had ideas and they never knew how to take these ideas forward. So Tina has a huge background in finances. And I remember one time how this project came about. There was a lady who is no longer with us. She's over 60, 65. She was talking about her journeys the finances, being in the asylum system and all that, and it became difficult for her. All what she was talking about is money journeys. And at one point she said, I wish somebody can record this, okay? And to me I was like, actually, there's stories around here. This is your culture. This is what feels, you know, good for you. This is what you, you have that you want other communities to benefit from you, but you didn't know how. And then when we sat together, we had other people talking to us about the same topics. And personal, I come from a cash economy, where cash is the main thing for me. The use of credit cards is a difficult thing. I still want to hold my cash. So when we started doing this, we felt like actually there's a lot that we can do together as a community. And again, in Kula Wellness, we approached the National Heritage Fund and they were so supportive. We got the funding. We got partners on board, which is the WE Museum, who have been amazing, Heather, and your team. You've been fantastic. And uh, you made everybody feel it's home. So where we are right now, and I know Tina is going to talk about all this, OK, the stories, whatever has happened, it's been a journey for all of us, the contributors who have been in this, they've been so amazing. So our team will continue to develop new ideas, and please feel free to share those ideas with us. This is just a beginning for us, and we would like to take this further and further. I'm not going to take so much, much of your time. If there's any question later on during networking, you know, let's share and you know contribute to the good ideas that will be coming up okay thank you very much i'll hand you over to greg okay um for anybody watching the live stream if you can hear some background noise we're still rearranging the room uh, but i hope you can hear us all and join in so next we have the fireside uh first fireside chat and it's with um eva David, Ife, and Tina. So if you've heard your name there, and Tina's already spoken to you, you'll know that you're expected on the stage. So if we can welcome to the stage Eva, David, Ife, and Tina, that would be wonderful. For the fireside chat, we don't have a fireside, but we've got candles. Um, so we've done, we've done our best. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's all right. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I cannot tell you how overwhelmed <laughs> we've been at the response. At, at, you know, we, we sold out the event in, in minutes, which was crazy. Um, but also for trusting us, for trusting us with doing this, for trusting us with your stories. I, I am so deeply honored to be trusted with, with stories of those who are way older than me and who have done this so many times. The program has been meticulously um, designed because this was not about me as Tina, not at all. And it was not about us as Inkula Wellness, it was not about us as Manimatics, it was not about us as individuals. It really is about the visibility of who we are as a unit. And we are so many more things than what the system portrays us to be. When I was growing up, I say this all the time, I did not know that I was a woman, and I did not know that I was a person of color. I was just this person that could live and could do anything I put my mind to. My parents are entrepreneurial. I found out in this project that most people from African backgrounds have come through an entrepreneurial journey. And my parents would say to me, if there is a problem, find out how we solve it. And I just would do it. So I had to come to the UK to find out I was a woman that was black. And that shocked me for a few times. I was like, right, okay, so I'm black. <laughs> What does that mean? And it was such a journey of discovery, and it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's impacted how I work, it's impacted everything I do, it's impacted the things I see things through. But I think the best way to distill what I feel about this project, the book, and everything that we've done is something I wrote in the preface of the book. So I'll just read what I wrote, and then I'll hand it over to, to um, the, the contributors who I'm so, so thankful for. There, there was... We, we interviewed so many people. We have over, you know, 45 interviews we've done. So I apologize for anyone that didn't make it into the book. The 10 stories that made it into the book were either based on the journeys and, and the difference, because we were trying to show as much difference as we possibly could. Heritage is here, so who knows? There could be a part two. <laughs> Let's hopefully do that. But I, I just want to give tribute and, and to say thank you so, so much right. to, to everybody who, that has contributed to this, especially the ones that are way older than me. I am so, so thankful on behalf of Enkula Wellness and, and the team that has brought this together. So I'll start by reading my, uh, the preface because hopefully it explains um, where I'm at with, with what I feel about my journey to the UK, and then I'll hand it over uh, to these guys. Um, I said, before I turned the first page of this journey, my life had already been deeply colored by my move to Scotland 16 years ago. This move shaped my identity and my career as a financial inclusion expert and a money coach. The initial challenges of integrating blossomed into living, lived experiences that illuminated my path and continue to guide my work positioning me as a natural fit to write this work. I'm really privileged to author this book as an integral part of an immigrant's financial journey project, which has been led by Enkula Wellness Hub. The, this innovative project was born from a team's discovery of a significant gap in the literature on the rich heritage and financial stories of people who have chosen Scotland as their new home. Recognizing the importance of sharing these migration experiences and with the invaluable support of our community and the valued collaboration of the Living Memory Association, We Museum, and the National <coughs> Library of Scotland, we sought the support of Heritage Lottery Fund. Their belief in our mission has enabled us to capture and preserve these powerful stories of future for future generations. It's been a beautiful journey of discovery and learning uncovering new depths of understanding and insight as we've conducted in-depth research, produced a limited series podcast. You guys need to sign up and listen to the podcast. There's some hilarious, hilarious stories on there. Um, so please do check out the podcast and a meticulous comp compilation of narratives for this book. I've realized that if we could only dare to listen, if we could attempt to observe and open our hearts to empathize, we would learn something in every interaction we ever have. This book has been brought together by a village. It truly is the fruit of collective labor. 
nurtured and harvested by a community in the truest sense. And I leave you with this thought. When people from far and wide migrate to the continent of Africa, they are referred to as experts. But when Africans migrate to other parts of the world, they are immigrants. Truer words have never been illustrated than in the proverb, until the lion tells the story, the hunter will always be the hero. It is a great privilege and an honor to be a lion and tell the story of lions. I sincerely thank everyone who has entrusted me with their stories, their heritage, and their financial journeys. We have reclaimed the narrative, honoring our shared heritages with every word in this book. Thank you so much, everyone. And being a lion, as I illustrated, I will not let us roar, but in my culture, when you're celebrating something, you make a sound. So I'm going to get us to make the sound, and I'll set it off. So that's my lion's roar. <laughs> and I thank you, everybody, for making this possible for us having these stories that we can share. Uh, I'm going to start off with David. Thank you so much, David, for being a part of this project. You've been part of the Fireside Conversations. I learned so much. Guys, I thought I knew a lot about money. And then this project has just showed me that I'm, 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 in, I'm doing baby steps. I have no clue what I'm doing. Uh, and David was, was one of those. I, I just could not believe how long you've been here. And I would like you, please, to share about what it's been like for you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Okalo Oloa. Uh, I may say that I've been the longest person in Britain. I, I arrived in the UK on the 20th of March, 1969. So that's a long time ago. Um, Newcastle, and then Edinburgh, and now I stay in West Lothian. Yeah, I've been involved working for the health service and the local government as well. Now, when Tina and Jonathan approached me and Professor Mukami that we have started a project of, of the money because we think that our young people may not know how the money came about. And I found that was very interesting. And then I said, well, I said, could you share with us what you think? Now, for me, when we are talking about the money during our time, when I was young, how the money was in Uganda, of course I'm from Uganda, how the money was, did come about. So <laughs> we found very, very interesting. When the British introduced money <laughs> in Africa, East Africa, because of the, the thing we don't know how to count, so the money in coin, they got a hole in the middle. <laughs> so you, you put them, you string it to count how many, because a hundred shillings of hundred cent is equal to one shilling, you know, thing like that. So, because we did not have the pocket, so the only way to do it was to, to tie and, and so on. But initially, now, my father was a local government officer. You know what he told me, son? How much was he getting? 15 shillings a month, because the value of money was very powerful. One shilling could buy trousers, 25 cents would buy things, so the value was, was very good. But that, that was the, the kind of money we knew. Uh, initially, the exchange rate was 20 shillings to the pound, like there, then gradually thing, so they introduced in East Africa 
East African money, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, which was, you know, the same value. But this is the, the type of money we knew, but it was the British who introduced it uh, in Africa. Now, that is part of the money, but my life in Britain, as, as I've seen, <laughs> when I came back now, because not knowing the money, when I arrive in, uh, in London, I have to get the transport. So to know the changes, I didn't, I didn't know how, uh, what type of money is to just give. Because the, the way they were counting it is different in Uganda. So as we said, living in a, in a, in a strange country, in a different currency, it, 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 it's very, very difficult. But I also found out it was not only us here. When in 1971 they changed the British money, <laughs> the older people did not know the, the, the exchange. They were rejecting money. I don't, I don't know about that. They are also having problems. It's not only in a strange country. Even the, the people here were having problems when the changes took place. So. My life here in Britain, uh, which you can sell with you, um, because of course when you arrive in a country, um, you are not sure about yourself. People are not sure about you, you are not accepted. So it has been a big challenge, but depend on the personality. Yeah, so, um, which made me got involved in the union work, and we have to start the black unit myself. Um, like Professor Mukami was controlling equality in, in the UK, which is, is really very difficult. We found that it was lack of knowing the, the, the difference between the community. My late wife and I went to Falkirk, <laughs> and when we were walking, we were attacked by the, the white young boys. They called them skinhead, you know, one Briton white. But we have to, to fight with that. And the good thing, the CID was walking with us, and so we did not have any any problem. Then the boy was eventually arrested and taken him. So that, that was about the racism, which is not only the place of work, it's also outside, but it's the fear of unknown. Yeah. So how did they tackle this problem? When I stayed in a place called Bonaise, yes, a minor town, I decided to, to join the football club. So I was trying to play with the community. So from there, people start accepting, oh, who's this? Yeah. Then they gave me Danny boys and so on. So that was an opportunity. People now start accepting me in the community because I got involved in, in what they were doing. But it's, it's a very big challenge. But this book is not only about the money, but I think it's encapsulate all our life in when you are in a new society, how you accept it. But because of the uh, the colonial issues, when the European go come to our country. We welcome them with a hand. But when we come this way, we are not accepted very well. So, so that should be a lesson for everybody. So thank you uh, very much. I don't want to take much of your time, but I would like to thank Tina, of course, Jonathan, Mukami, Everybody whom I met during the conversation 
in um, we museum. Yeah, the museum, the the the, the we one. Yes. Yeah, the, <laughs> the we museum. So it was, it was very good. They're all here, yes. and all my participants. So thank you ever so much. Uh, if anybody sometime coming to the Lithgow Palace, we call it Royal Borough of Lenethgo. Mm. So come for a cup of tea. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for sharing that. Okay. Um, I would like to invite Eva, who was just, I just, I, I don't even know what to say. She just she fascinates me. Like, <laughs> we, we were meant to have one podcast recording with her, and uh, I ended up doing two. And, and, uh, and I still need about two more because there's so much to learn still. But the most intriguing thing about Eva for me was one of the things I, I was saying at the beginning of this was, you know, we, have, uh, we, we don't want to have any political views and, and no religion. This is a very, it needs to be really about the immigrants' financial journey. And it needs to be about, you know, the, the story around that. And we're putting together this book. And she agreed. She said, absolutely, Tina. And as soon as I pressed record, she starts off saying, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, I did? <laughs> and I'm trying to hint. I'm trying to say, I'm like, mama. <laughs> mama, I'm a God girl too. I, I, I am Christian, very much so. But this is not the forum. <laughs> and then she, she keeps going a bit and she said, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> so I have to put a disclaimer that I am Christian. <laughs> But I did not put her up to anything that she did on those, on those days. Um, very, very interested to hear. I, I was so thankful that you took part in the project. Thank and you. we just want to hear what, what you have to say, Eva. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really, really grateful that you guys have managed to do what so many tried to do but could not succeed. Not succeed because the white people stopped us but we stopped ourselves. And there's a man, I went with my friend, here's this lady, Anna. Um, please lift your hands so at least people, yeah. We went to, a man who used to live here was in hospital. We went to see him. And from nowhere, this man started recounting his experience. How he made so much money, he was so generous. And a bank manager who was jealous because the first bank manager went left. And the next one just basically caused him to lose everything because he had a house in, in um, Bearsden and the bank manager couldn't buy a house in Bearsden. So how dare you, a black person, having a house in Bearsden? And then he found out that he had so many properties. But the point I'm making, when I was coming from Ghana, I had just finished school, and I thought I was grown up. I wanted to get my, married, and my mom said, oh, no, you're too young. So when I was 20, my mom said, no. So 21, I said, can I marry him? He said, mm, OK. So the whole idea was at that time, Ghana was doing so well economically. So all I, we were here for was my husband was here for four years to do a, 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 a master's and a PhD. And after the PhD, I was going to be a lecturer's wife and not just ordinary lecturer, you know? So for me, life was about go and learn as much as you can from the new people you meet. And then you can share a little bit, you know, when the opportunity arises. But then somebody told me, oh, you don't know. They didn't even call it racism. These white people, they are really bad. And so they told me all the story. And then they told me about, oh, the Christians stay away. I thought, oh. So somehow I became very cautious. And it was going nowhere. And then something said, how do you want people to remember you? When you meet someone, they don't know that their aunties and uncles and whatever came to loot your country. All they know is they met Eva. How do they remember this Eva? So 
I taught my children later on, when you are on a bus and you see a child smile because you may be the first black person the child is meeting. And then um, I also decided, look, the key that opens my door in Ghana will not open the doors here. So I've got to learn some things which I don't know about. I didn't know there was something called a chapa. So I've got to ask people, and who can I ask? So I happen to live in Cumbernauld. Please don't say anything bad about Cumbernauld or Glasgow or else I'll never talk to you. So I got to Cumbernauld and people loved me truly. And they taught me so many things. I'll ask questions. I was doing Avon. That was my plan, to be able to get into people's houses to get to know them. And I did. And the whole town, if I was going into town with you, we would not come back because everybody who meets me stop, Eva, how are you? And it's, it wasn't a greeting, truly meaning it. And you will know without me telling you. So eventually, um, somebody, I, 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 I went to somebody's door and I got to know them, know them for a few minutes and they said, what are you doing, Avon, and all this nonsense? So you should go to college. And then, and you should do modern studies and history. I said, oh, okay, whatever that is. So I went to another door, and there was a doctor. And he said, Eva, have you considered going to college? Go to college, I'll pay for it. Oh, okay, I'll go and tell the husband. He said, look, this husband of yours, I met him. He's not going to let you do it. You go, I'll pay. So I did. And then I got to, I went to night school. So I'll put the children to bed by six o'clock. My children were ready for bed. They washed and ready to go to bed. And I'll go to um, my night school. So I got my highest. And then before I knew the marriage broke up and I had to live. By, by that time, I had also been going around telling, Scotland should be independent. <laughs> oh, Scotland should be independent. I knew so much about Scottish history. I don't know why and how I did when I was a child. So when I came, it was really, I wanted to find the reality. I was so disappointed because I knew Scottish men to be tall and strong and very, very truthful. And really, um, uh, what, what was it, the truthful and boldness. So Scottish, that was my understanding and perception of Scottish men. When I came, they were still a bit, they were not tall, but, but <laughs> as I had imagined, and they were not, um, you know, like Popeye, mm. but they loved truthfulness and they loved justice. So it was great. And so um, I would ask questions and I found out, oh, this is how you can buy a house. This is how you, you can get a mortgage, whatever that is. And then eventually, when I said to my, my husband, maybe we should buy a house, the man went ballistic. <laughs> but then when the marriage broke up, and I thought, I'm paying rent. So how do you, what do you need to do? They've told me, you don't even have to have money to get a mortgage. So again, I put that into practice. And my grandfather, when I was a child, was talking to somebody uh, about buying shares and uh, bonds and all the rest of it. So I came to this place. And when I heard something on the TV, I go, oh, right. So um, I, I, to cut a long story short, I bought my house and then I told everybody I was on a campaign. Every woman who was on her own should buy a house. She, and this is how you do it. And go to this man, he will give you a mortgage and you tell him, you don't even say my name because he didn't know me when I went there and he said, oh, I'll give you a mortgage. I said, I told you I'm a single parent and I'm also a student. She said, what are you on about? I said I'll give you a mortgage. So come on Monday. Monday I'll go, I'll go to see the man and he said, have you got 30 pounds for a down payment? I'll give you 50. So that's how I got my mortgage. <laughs> I got my house. Oh boy, and I wanted 
the whole African community to know. Because my marriage broke up, people were gossiping, celebrating, and whatever, whatever, whatever. And I couldn't tell, and to, to make matters worse, the home office gave me two weeks to leave. Oh, God. oh Lord. So I got to my grant and decided, oh no, I can't leave. Uh, I can't spend it to buy books. If I'm leaving, I need this money. And somebody said, there's some place called UKIS or whatever. So go there. I went to my children's father, and for some reason, the man forgot who I was and told me where that UKIS was because I didn't know where it was in Glasgow. And when the lady took, was screaming at all the Asian men, I thought, oh, dear. I go there, and she said, yes, I told her. I said, I've been given two weeks to leave, and... My children, five children, under eight, and I'm not even 30 yet. I wasn't 30, I said. Um, the woman said, I'll help you. And to cut a long story short, I got my stay, and I felt, wow. And again, I started, there's a lady who was always a gossip. So she called me, and I wanted to tell her, be naughty to let her know. <laughs> Now I have arrived. So <laughs> I said, she said, why are you not moving to Glasgow? I said, oh, now I can't. Now that I've bought my house, and I've also got <laughs> my forever stay, permanent stay. <laughs> so, so basically, I couldn't tell the black people do this, because it was no go. They were uh, truly. But then, when I started university, I wasn't a university in Caledonian. I met some African ladies. They, one of, they all moved to London. Uh, one, I think one is dead now. They were so gracious, so kind. And they said, we don't want to hear about your marriage breakup ever again. I said, OK. He said, not that I was talking about it too much. And it was the best thing they said to me. And they said, and also, we don't want to see you without your makeup. I said, OK. And so if one of them met me anywhere, there were about four of them. One was from Uganda. <laughs> and, um, and one was from Ghana. Oh, Lord. So these, these people would say to me, you've got to dress. I was always dressing up, but sometimes I get tired. I go, oh, they would say, no. Go back home and, and get yourself sorted. So that day, I respected them. I honored them. And so they were, they were able to open up and help me to be the woman I needed to be. And I wanted to also share that with everybody. We tried to set up an African embassy, not an embassy aside, but somewhere where uh, any information you needed about Africa, you will get at least a little bit to help you, and we will direct you to where you needed to go. The day we were going to put the application in, and we had been assured by Glasgow City Council that they would give us um, the fund I, had, I was passing by another pe Ghanaian person's way, and we were talking, and I said, oh, this is what we are going to do. He said, can I see your application? I said, oh, yeah. He copied everything and, and, and went to that place and place it there. So the next day when we went, the lady said, uh, and she said, Eva, but you've already put it. And I said, no, Anne. I've never been, I've not been here. She said, you have, there's an application. And it was that person's. And eventually the person got the money, but what did it, what did it do? And then, so we were not the first. There were, those before me had also tried, done so many things because life for a man in Scotland is not easy. And it's even more difficult for a black man. That's true. But for me, the journey has been very challenging and very beautiful because I had help all the way, you know, from wherever. 
people helped me. If you reject me, I just move on. I have no time. But if you hold it and you refuse to give it to me or to help me from a good heart, then my grandmother taught me, move on. Never look back. And I don't. Thank if you, you need so help, much. I'll <laughs> help you. But I can't come back. So I'm grateful for what you guys have done. And I hope that it will be an example and it will continue to actually establish a community because we don't have an African community. Thank you. So I think you can see what the conversation cafes have been like. <laughs> A lot of conversation, a lot of insight. Thank you so much, Eva. I, I, I find I, I'm just fascinated, as I said. You're very, a very strong, strong person, and you, you've managed to do so much with so much adversity. Um, and, and we're really thankful that you were part of the project. It was different. It wasn't the same. Um, down from how you apply for a job, how you get the interview, and how you finally end up um, having a job. And what you would do in your job is actually, we are all human, like I said, but it was different. And I had to like try to fit in, in one way or the other. And then um, I can remember one time, uh, because I just got married and came over, I was having a conversation with my husband, and he was like, I think you're not um, happy in this marriage in this country, I was like, yes, I am not, because I'm trying to get used to this new uh, environment, and I'm trying to get used to being a married woman, like everything in one. So I remember when I was like newly pregnant, I was crying, and my husband went to work on the tw 25th December. For my first ever Christmas, staying with him, leaving my family, because I have a huge family, we all come together back home to celebrate Christmas. And I found myself in this country that I have nobody. And my husband had to walk on that 25th Christmas. And I was like newly pregnant. Like I cried my eyes out. I called my mom, called everyone. I said, you know what? That's me done with this marriage and in this country. I'm coming back home. And I can remember somebody calling my husband. And my husband, he was in the, in the British Army then. He had to tell the sergeant or whoever um, that was in charge that night, my, my wife is not feeling well. She's depressed. I had to go back home. And when he came, I was like, look for my passport. Give it to me. I'm going back home. He was like, no, that's, I, that's not how, how, how it, it's done. And that's not how it should be done. I was like, like, whatever you say doesn't make any meaning to me. I really don't understand it. All I know is, that's me done. I can't stay here and I can't stay in this marriage because I'm not coping well. He panicked a whole lot, but finally everything settled. <laughs> we still married up to date. But <laughs> it wasn't an easy journey. I started making my babies and then I started fitting in the culture, everything, and everything started making more sense to me. And finally, I am, I'm still here. I got myself up to this point and it wasn't an easy journey. If I'm to go back to the uh, financial aspect of things, um, again, it wasn't an easy one because when I was back home, Tina told me chop one, chop two. I, my mom had the business, so I had to um, manage the business somehow. Um, um, f uh, my, we, we are six of us. I'm the fifth child. Um, and then for some reason, I just found myself the person that had to manage my mom's business, that chop one, chop two we had at the time. So I really like to um, be um, financial independent, I should say. I really like to do things like get into business and do things for myself. But um, when I came over here, huh, the opportunity wasn't much. It was very, very, very tight. I had to like get into employment, look for a job. Up till date, I'm still trying to find my fit, trying to get to where I'm supposed to be because I haven't arrived yet, but I know I'm getting somewhere. So um, it's like, like everyone had said here, like um, it's a journey. We all came from somewhere. We might not be where, I might not be, I'll just speak for myself. I might not be where I want to be at this time, but I know there is opportunity for me to get to where I plan to be in the future. Yeah. Is it easy? No. There are challenges, like always, everywhere. Yeah. But there is possibility at the end of the day. 
Thank you so very much for uh, <laughs> being part of this journey. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, this is a flavor of what, what the book's been about. And, and um, I was talking to a friend over lunch recently, and, and, and she was talking about something called the burden of representation. I really feel that deeply because, I mean, I had all these stories. I mean, lots of them and many that we have not featured. And I have to, I felt like, oh my goodness, I have to do a good job of it. I have to show everybody up as they are while, while remaining true to the culture. Because one big thing for me is I feel that the West has an impression of Africans in a certain way. And my responsibility to say, no, we come from somewhere. We are visible. We are amazing, by the way. And could it be that your systems are the ones that are making us you know, slow down or not do what we're supposed to do. So I had a very heavy burden of representation. And so it's, it's just been a pleasure and an, uh, to be able to, to share. Um, and I've not done it justice, I'm sure. But, you know, just for you guys to allow me to do this has been amazing. And uh, maybe on this note, everyone that's uh, been part of the book, if you don't mind standing up, I know you're not expecting this. Guys, I learned so many new things, including the fact that in Libya... <laughs> one of the ways to keep assets was camels. I found that amazing. You know, I was thinking about property and all these things, and, and, and Camel just comes up and he says, yeah, you can, you can buy camels, and you know, and I was like, that makes absolute sense, but I would not have had a clue before. So it's been such an amazing journey, um, but um, maybe Graham is pointing me to say, no, we shouldn't do that now, so <laughs> we'll, we'll do it later. But thank you so much to the panel. Thank you. You're welcome. Tina stays on the stage, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad timekeeper. Sometimes there are more important things than what the clock says. Those are amazing stories, and it was well worth hearing every second of them. Um, I'm going to invite to the stage the extraordinary illustrator. I feel so honored to be wearing an illustration. Um, so uh, we couldn't fit five chairs on the stage, so we're now going to invite um, Zarista to the stage to talk about the <laughs> illustrations. For people who haven't seen the book yet, you'll be blown away when you see the quality of these illustrations. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... This is the illustrator, woohoo! <laughs> so again, this was a really, really tough one. Me and Jonathan were back and forth a hundred times and, and Sharon and the rest of the team and were thinking, do we go dry? First of all, um, just to explain a bit about the book, it was important for me to represent money in a very fun and chilled out way because that's what money should be. Um, I just remember growing up never thinking about money, and, and this is actually an interesting thing. I became financially vulnerable when I came to the first world, interestingly. So I am from Africa, which is meant to be the dark continent and the third world, and I was extremely secure financially. I had to come to the UK, not to have a credit history, not to have a rating, no one to believe me, I spoke differently, and then I was vulnerable. So it was really, really important for me to, to have this, these stories represented in a way that was, was different because money doesn't have to be the dreary thing that Britain makes it out to be, but also we are a fun culture. So we, we, we decided on an illustrator and prayed really hard about it. And I'm so happy that, that Zarita just agreed to come on the journey. I, I, I will not even waste time. I'll, I'll let her tell us her bit of it. Okay, so becoming part of this project was very interesting because initially this is not a route I would have gone down but I saw the value in it um, as we discussed what it could be and how my skill set could lend itself to the stories being told and you made a phrase you mentioned the phrase the burden of representation and although I understand the concept of that phrase when I said yes it, it wasn't a burden to me it was exciting because it would be an exploration of other people's story and when you meet a person when you're engaging with people you exchange information and there's a truth that comes that allows you to be able to tell part of that story without saying it's your own and so I applied that to the illustration. Now, I was using AI. This is how I use, um, I use AI to develop all these images and then some other tools which I edited with. And that was an exploration of self. So what these stories allowed me to do was not only get insight of places I may never go 
of people I may never meet, but get principles and then think about how am I going to express this in a way that other people can connect with it, other people can stop for a moment and be challenged with questions because imaging is so very important. We know that ever more now in this present day when we have our Instagrams and our Facebooks and our whatever else you have. But every day we wake up and we see the sun, there's something that is communicated to us by the sun being up, we have a new day, we have new opportunity. And so I wanted the images to be like that to, to your stories, each and every one of your stories, that it would be an indicator to the person reading that there's hope, that there may be a challenge but you can overcome, that there's color to this story. Even though you might be crying at this point, there's a smile that can come and yes, there will be tears. And I, I believe that images should do that. They should provoke you to the future. And so that's what this was for me. Then that's why I say it wasn't a burden. It was really encouraging and an inspiration for me to stretch me as well. Thank you so much. And the illustrations are fantastic. And we've only used a portion of them. So we're hoping to do like an exhibition at some point. And, and it's been a pleasure, a massive pleasure working with you. Your work ethic has been amazing. Um, you're up at silly o'clock, you know, when I, <laughs> when I need you to be. So thank you so much. And please, let's give her a round of applause. She's done amazing. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to leave the stage and invite <laughs> uh, one of the contributors in the book. Uh, her name is Mariama, amazing culture, very deep culture, but I was really fascinated by the fact that she's from a tribe called the Jellies, and the Jellies are, the, the way they, they're the keepers of stories. I found that fascinating, and we've managed to twist her arm to come up and, and do a little bit, uh, a brief five minute piece from, from this Jelly culture. Uh, and the most interesting thing is the music that you're going to be hearing in the background is her grandfather's music. So it's, it's quite a nice piece of heritage. Uh, and so we'll welcome you, Mariama, and I'll go and listen. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Are we going to listen to my granddad? <laughs> Okay, so while I wait for the um, background music to start, um, uh, I would just like to say a thank you to Tina and um, Jonathan for giving me this opportunity to um, uh, talk about issues. My granddad is not here yet. Okay. <laughs> the music, I'll be working on it in the back. Okay. <laughs> um, so I am originally from Gambia. My name is Maria Majobate. Um, uh, our origin or our heritage is from Mali. Um, uh, I come from a tribe um, called um, the Mandinka tribe in Gambia. Our heritage, um, the, the, the Jalis, we are used to performing using choras. I'm a terrible one. So that's why I did not even attempt to bring any Cora here. I have a shame to my plan. <laughs> so um, uh, what we normally, or what, what this whole migration reminds me is that we have a beautiful culture in Africa. Let us explore and think about where we come from. You know, um, uh, the warmth of family settings in Africa. You know, the beautiful streets we, you know, um, come from in Africa, the settings, you know, the peace that we have in Africa. People like us decide to leave whatever we have there and come to the UK, for example, to, for better, for better um, future prospects. We do come in different forms. Sometimes people come here as asylum seekers, refugees, education, you know, um, uh, but it's like uprooting a tree to somewhere else so it can be nurtured and raised again. I came here as a, as a teenager. Um, I grew up, um, uh, mo well, my adult life has been in the UK. So leaving my heritage to start a fresh life in the UK means that 
I have to face challenges that you know a lot of the speakers spoke about. But one of the things that made me happy about my journey in the UK, it's my, um, uh, my work as a woman women's rights advocate. Um, we have heard women here talking about their journeys. What we do not a lot of the times think about is the struggles of African women within our own settings. How we, as Africans, are not very supportive of each other, not because we choose to, but because circumstances dictate that we have other priorities. You know, in our homes, we have to look for money. We have to, you know, do certain things to ensure that our children grow up you know, in, 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 in a nurturing environment, they, their needs are sorted. To do that, it means that our husbands, you know, for example, would have to go work. Us as mothers, we also have to go and fend for ourselves and our children. Now, the problem that we might have is that we do not have, like babysitters, we are not privileged to have our aunties, our grandmas, to leave our children with. You know, what these issues do is intensify issues in our own homes. These are things that we normally overlook and uh, tensions start building and it can result to domestic violence. It can result to sexual and gender-based violence in our homes. When an African talks about their journey, about migration, we need to listen. Let us not use the theory that we learn in universities, for example. Let us listen to people and their practical experiences. It tells us a lot about how we can educate each other, how we can be supportive of each other. And one thing I want to say to men here, you don't have to be a black man. You know, any color you are, can we please try to be supportive of women from Africa? Because we have a lot of silent voices who need help, the least we can do for them is give them listening ears. They need it. We do need it. I fear the day, you know, like the future where my children grow up in Scotland, even though, you know, um, research found that Scotland has, you know, a welcoming, it's a welcoming home for migrants. But I fear the day that my children would grow up and feel or encounter the journey I have encountered being seen as a migrant instead of you know, a Scottish citizen, you know, somebody who lives in Scotland, somebody who would leave and not encounter discrimination like I did, somebody who would walk down the street, go find a job and be treated like the normal Scottish person. You know, I want to see a day where my children feel comfortable as much as any Scottish person. So let us support each other. Let us come together. It doesn't matter what color you have so we can, you know, encourage the future generation. Thank you. Everybody, I'm so sorry. There was supposed to be music that accompanied that. And when you hear what a voice in words Mariana had, it's such a shame that we couldn't hear you with the music. Hopefully, there'll be another occasion. Um, I'm going to join the stage now briefly um, so we can talk about the book. Um, phone three years ago, and, uh, and I said yes. And, and saying yes is something I think is a really powerful thing to do. And I said yes to working with Tina, um, and it's been a really excellent experience. Um, and uh, the library, as I said at the start, you're sitting on 50 miles of shelves below you. There's 50 million things in this building. And we don't always know what we have until somebody says, have you got anything on African culture or the, or, or the financial journey of, a, of, of people who are migrating to different countries? And then when we look and we have a reason, we find that we've got all sorts of things. And so there's a, a temporary display upstairs and we found that we had a, a Ugandan early banknote, which is a really significant thing. And we didn't know we had that until the conversations happened. So the conversations that we have with community groups result in all sorts of things, and they result in friendships. Um, and we can only collect things when they're recorded 
and they're written down. And so... The experiences and knowledge and memories from wonderful communities of Africans in Scotland. I've heard about how in Uganda and elsewhere in Africa, you're used to a cash society. Yes, I remember those days too. Not much of it. And how you help folk here with adjusting to an almost cashless society. Even things like checks, which I used for many years, have almost disappeared. I can't remember the last time I wrote a check. I tried to avoid it anyway. I do also remember when I first started work many years ago in London, and I had to set up a bank account. I was extremely nervous, and it took me some while before I felt comfortable going into a bank. Nowadays, nowadays, we don't go into banks much either. It's the ATM, the hole in the wall. I look forward to hearing more, and I have already, about the work that you're doing and to listening to more of the podcasts. I've listened to, to a couple already, which you recorded at the Wee Museum. I'm also hoping to walk away <laughs> with a signed copy of Thriving Beyond Borders, available now on Amazon. We'd be more than happy to work in partnership with Enkula on this very valuable project. And it's a, it's a great opportunity to bring people from diverse backgrounds together in harmony, togetherness, and well-being to share their experiences. I mentioned harmony. What I can say about the WEMA here is that it has a unique workforce of around 20 plus people almost unparalleled, I would say, in temperament in human history. Some are full-time and others, like me, are volunteers. In my experience, if you have a workforce of 20 folk, you'll rarely work in harmony. There'll be at least two who are unbearable. There'll be one or two who really should be working somewhere else. And there'll be another couple who rarely turn up on time. But that's not true of the Wee Museum. I find that extraordinary. I put it down to Heather's personal judgment. How I slipped through the net, I don't know. <laughs> I think Heather has shown impeccable judgment once again in partnering up with Enkula Wellness, who are another organisation full of genuinely good people like Tina. Uh, <laughs> um, in partner, yeah, who are another, yes, like, and Jonathan, sorry, Jonathan, as well, who have come together to produce an excellent book and a series of eye-opening podcasts on the experiences of different African communities in Scotland, from Uganda to Nigeria, Libya, Botswana, the Gambia, and beyond, and from Ghana all the way to Leith. We've been privileged to share in your journey of memories. Very well done to all involved. And finally, I thank you again for attending and for inviting us here today to the Let and also to the Heritage Lottery Fund for all their tremendous support. I extend the invitation to any of you to come and visit us at the Ocean Terminal, the Wee Museum, and to share your memories. Where did I write it? <laughs> ah! So I now say, Webbidi no. Which apparently means you, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's for the museum. Thank you. Thank you so much. I said, <laughs> I'll sign it after. No, but I, I think it will be worth it something Heather there. and Barry need to stand up where they are and give everybody a wave because they've been an amazing part of well, yeah. Thank you. So nice, nice. Okay. Uh, we now have. Um, George and Tina for the Jambo Radio interviews. Uh, so if George is here, he can come to the stage and make sure his button turns green. There you go. Is it turned green? It's not turned green yet. 
Oh, okay, good. Let me sit here. Should I sit anywhere? Uh, for, the, for the cameras, can I sit anywhere? <laughs> um, wonderful. So I've really got very limited time for this Jumbo Radio interview. Thank you. For those of you that are no head of Jumbo Radio, it's the only radio station for people of African and Caribbean heritage right here in Scotland. And uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, this uh, literature is very important for all of the things that we do and opening up this conversation. So I'm very privileged to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Tina, for inviting and also making us become aware of this. I know we have very limited time. So, but I'll quickly use 30 seconds to kind of share my, real, my kind of, um, 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 how these stories within this group, which I've read, um, not all of it yet, but um, I've read most of it, 85% on the train to here. <laughs> because I've got my computer yesterday, <laughs> last night. Um, so, and um, one of the things that I picked up there, so much similarities across the, cult the, 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 the different cultures that, and uh, uh, the attitude towards money and uh, uh, people's experiences. And my one for 22 years, and I always share these stories, the first two years of my time in Scott, you know, don't you know? Sorry. Yes, it's on. It it's might green. just need a little bit higher to your mouth. We just want to be sure everybody can hear you. I've just so. been out of the studio. Maybe I'll turn it on my voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, can everyone hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, good. Well, you didn't want to miss the story. Anyway, so I was where? Um, yeah, my time I've been in this country. Yeah, so um, uh, 22 years now, and uh, the first two years were um, illegal. So, um, but don't tell anybody or immigration officer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now, we're regulating uh, everything, so my stay has been for 20 years. However, my, when I was growing up, my mom's attitude towards uh, money was uh, whenever she gave me money to go, my pocket money to go to school, and I have to come up with some change. But I didn't know that in the early part of the uh, first years in primary school, and when she gave me money for for um, something to get to school. I, I didn't realize that I have to come back with a bit of change. So, okay, so, yes, okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. I'll put all the medals on, don't worry. <laughs> one is gold, uh, one is gold, one is uh, silver. So uh, my mom, whenever I come back from school, I was wondering why this woman used to scream at me. You know, every time she gives me money and she expects me to come back with a bit of change. So when I go, I spend all the money and she go, like, you spend all the money? Really dramatically, that sort of stuff. So um, I grew up knowing that, you know what, whatever amount of money you have, you need to save a little bit and you always need to come back with a bit of change. So that was my attitude. I was interested to share that bit of story um, because I think there's a lot of relevance of what is happening here. Now, the approach that you've used, and you mentioned it earlier, um, in this book was um, illustration, read stories as well. Um, how long did that take you? The better part of two years. <laughs> <laughs> um, two years to map And why did you make that choice? Because um, money is a difficult subject. Um, yesterday I put something on social media and it was important to me what I used. I wanted to use something that was fun and flamboyant just to say that money should be approachable. It, it shouldn't be this very serious conversation that we sit down and just talk about money on its own. And money is a part, um, I like to say this a lot, that money is the one thing that affects us whether we like it or not. Whether you like money, whether you don't like it, it is something that is unavoidable. It's like death. It's like being born and dying. You, these are things that are going to happen. So whether you have money or not, it's going to affect you. Mm -hmm. So why not weave it into the stories? Um, and then in, in the case of, of people of, um, you know, who have migrated to the UK, we have stories before we come here. So money looks different from where you're from. Money looks different when you come here. You're viewed differently for your money here than you are in a different place. So I wanted to use the storytelling basis to then give key simplified understandings of what money can do. Yeah, and money is always a difficult conversation, as yes. you say, and it's one of the things that is also affected or affects a lot of people in terms of um, when they when, when, when we start to integrate in this country. Because I remember using my overdraft all the time. Uh, I don't know why, and I don't know what I did with that money, but um, it was a very uh, eye-opening moment for me because uh, I was spending all my overdraft. The first time I got a credit card, I squandered it completely. <laughs> uh, you, know, um, uh, you don't want to hear what I squandered it on. 
seriously, but it was booze. Because a proper Scottish way to behave, isn't it? So, <laughs> so um, yeah. So, uh, so it, those lessons were there. It, you know, affected my credit record for some time. So I, um, so, so part of this was, um, are you trying to find a way? We using this approach to normalize conversations around money because we hate to talk about money. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. It's normalizing the conversations about money, and it's also not thinking about money as this big one, big devil you know mm. chip on the little sides look at your relationships look at what you can do with your career just whatever it is that you can touch about money mm. make your difference one step at a time um and then things will get better the other thing that was important for me to put out in the book especially when i was having one of the interviews was that especially as people of color or Africans when we come here, we forget all the things that we grew up with. We forget all the amazingness that we grew up with. So I was at an investor event and I was talking to someone and saying, girl, you are an angel investor because you send money back home every day for your brothers to open a business. So when, this, when you see the white people here talking about angel investment, you are an angel investor, so embrace it. And so if you start looking at money and thinking about yourself differently mm -hmm. and start feeling a part of the fabric of where you are, then you can do things with money. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in the terms of the conversation building up to, you know, to capture all these stories, you talked about the, the cafe that you, um, you know, having chat with different people. Um, did you find anything that shows that there's been a kind of, apart from those stories that have been, awakening stories that have been there, do you think that uh, it's become um, within uh, the community now, most majority of the population, if this kind of conversation around money or do you think that's the element of ignorance in that um absolutely there, there, there'll always be dark spots i mean i was learning stuff as well i've shared with you when when uh Kamel was talking about the the camels and i had no clue there's always something you can learn but i think one thing we're trying to say is don't this this conversation about money it's not for the experts it's for everybody because guess what each of us needs money each of us needs to use money so you, because you have to use money you have to be a part of that conversation and only you i, I say this to my children all the time only you decide how things go for you so it's, it's a chess board and money is one of those things you're going to have to deal with it so choose how you play with it choose how you talk about it it's your story to tell and that's what this is about it's your story to tell and everyone has something we can learn from yeah managing money in a new country um this is a wonderful book i have, I have to say um and uh, i think i find it uh, the, the find the approach one uh, fascinating and uh, the illustrations as well really demonstrate uh, that so I, I would um as someone that maybe one of the few people that has been privileged to read this book um up to 85 percent I strongly recommend this. I think um, my time for the interview for Jumbo Radio is up, uh, but I would also like to capture the voice of uh, a couple of people uh, for this interview who are in this room. If you have any questions, please, it's your time. If you don't speak now, there is no other time you're going to ask Tina any question. <laughs> okay, who is up first? Anyone with a question for Tina in this book? What, has anyone read this book? Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it'll be good to hear. What do you make of it? Uh, I want to read it. It's, it's great to hear unique story, people's own unique stories mm -hmm. and um, the hints and tips that you give to people who are coming from different places, not just Africa, but for me, I was reading it as if you can come from anywhere in the world to a different country mm -hmm. and your finances, your financial outlook, the currencies you've dealt with, the systems that you're dealing with, everything changes dramatically. Mm -hmm. So I'm from Edinburgh. I've always lived in the UK. So I've never experienced some of these problems or issues that people have to solve. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great work that you've done, Tina. And um, I hope that people pick up your book and take some of these little hints and tips and hacks and explore them a little bit further and use that as a a means to start them off on a new journey. Yeah, well, that's absolutely correct. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to ask, you know, in the comment as well, I think this is really <coughs> good material for, uh, especially, you know, the, the future and the, the younger uh, Gen Z, um, uh, you know, generation. Why I say that? Because um, uh, some of us that has been decades here, 
we've already experienced it. So we've adjusted to something and, you know, whether managing our money properly or just going by, we've adapted to that. But uh, for those that are uh, the Gen Z especially, um, who are doing so many different things, including side hustle, know where you keep your money, know how to use your money, is very important. Anyone else want to kind of ask Tina any question about this so that I can have that uh, on Jumbo Radio? Well, if you don't want to talk on Jumbo Radio, it's fine, but I'll invite you on a separate time to come and speak exclusively. <laughs> Okay, no one is going to say anything. So, Sina, thank you very much. Oh, there's, no, yeah, yeah, you go. Okay, thank you. Yes, the lady there. Yeah, okay, the microphone, just wait for the microphone to come in there. Good yeah. afternoon. Um, my name is Nelly. I've met Tina today. <laughs> but we've been chatting because we're kind of in the same field because I also do personal finance championing. And one thing I have to ask you, Tina, is how have you been able to accommodate people's um, practices of how they spend their money and their mindset? Because it's, they, they kind of, well, they, they move together because it starts from how you think about it to how you get to use your money. How have you transitioned your mind to incorporate everything together? Yeah. That's a very good question, Nelly. Thank you for asking. Um, I think I was blessed in the sense that when we came here early on, um, our mindset was to work and take money, send money home to, you know, do projects back home and all that. And, and my mom, on one occasion, she's like, you've left here. I've now become your secretary. I'm, I'm running around finding investments for you. Why did you move there? May, try and make the UK your investment or your home base in terms of where your economic activity is happening. And I find that many people from our community, uh, we are trying to make it happen in so many places so we don't get anyone right. Uh, and it's back to the conversation earlier. What is the small thing that you can change? Because you are the one in charge. You're the one who decides how you spend the money. What's the small thing you can change? And for me, that small thing was deciding that for intents of money and, and how I was going to establish myself, I was going to do it properly in the UK because that's where I am. That's where I have control of the decisions that are being made. I don't have to make, pick up the phone and ask, have you built this? Have you, where is the land title? You know, I, I'm, I, can, I can take control of my situation here. And that's been a very tough journey, interestingly. I mean, same as starting a business or running an organization, but it's the determination that this is home right now. I'll make it work. And if I need to move somewhere else, that will work at that time. So it's, it's mindset, it's deciding which area you're going to work on, because we all can work on anything. And we all have, even the poorest of the poor, have a decision to make in how they wake up, in what they are going to do with the little money that they have on that day, and that decision moves you to the next step. So I think it's that mm. small, first step. Yeah, and we've we got to adapt the fact that um, we, if you move to Scotland, for example, you know, you, uh, it, it, it become home, mm. and you've got to put your money where your mouth is or where you, where you stay. Yes. And those, um, uh, um, those investments, sending money back home, which is always, for everybody, I think most of us have migrated, especially from Africa. It's been like, oh, I'm going to make some money, and then I'll send it home, I'll, I'll be some businesses, and then I'll, I'll go back home. 20 years later, you are in Glasgow or Scotland, and then you're like, oh, do I get a mortgage? I don't get a mortgage. You're 50 years old. Uh, you know, so those things, they do happen. That's, that's reality of um, uh, you know, what uh, does happen in our thinking. So if, um, uh, again, uh, it, you know, this book is really important. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, learning tool is also a really important. Uh, it, it gets, I think we, if we had this 20 years ago, uh, I think this would have really helped me to to adjust. You know, because uh, I adjusted. I was one of those people that adjusted a bit very late, um, because um, my, I came to my senses when I realized that money is not. It's just easily available. <laughs> so that, that may have more to do with the booze than the money. I think, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So that, that's why, yeah, the booze was also controlling the money. So uh, as I got rid of that. So that, that, that's, that's absolutely fine. So it is also thinking that if you want to do, um, uh, you know, uh, multiple investment in your future, is you have to build your future where you live. 
don't be your future where you don't slave. Mm -hmm. um, helping out families in far distance is fine, but um, it's also, yes. There's a microphone behind you there, sorry. Thank you. Based on what you said there, that if you had got this 20 years ago, so how do we get the book to the newcomers and also our young people? Yes. Because this shouldn't just be sitting on the computer. some library. It, people won't pick them up very good at all. How do we tell people? How do we get this has to go out? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think if, if in terms of me, you know, I was thinking obviously we're going to have a lot of conversations around this book on the radio, you'll be on the different radio programs, but it's also, I think, uh, some of the exhibition that you're thinking about, which you mentioned earlier, is a really good approach, but it will also be um, to look at means to tap into all the other networks and groups that exist in this, you know, there are all sorts of different community groups, associations uh, of interest, and um, those uh, different groups that we can do that. And I'm sure Tina has worked that out already. It's just, it's just a matter of time. But uh, it would need all of us, all of us, to make this, to popularize this book um, as a very important learning tool, especially early learning tool for new arrivals, uh, which some of us are not yet, except those that have been here uh, um, less than 10 years. Um, then you might um, need this. But um, I'm just saying that it's very important for us to make this book really uh, um, open up uh, to our children and the young people that are just arriving in the country to um, build a path there because everyone arrives and always thinks like, uh, always think um, in the next five years they're going to return to home, wherever home is. And then 20 years later, we are still here um, saying hello to each other. Uh, say, how long have you been here? 20 years or plus? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's kind of Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes, Miriam. Is it Miriam? Mariama. Mariama, Mariama, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I think I'm glad it, no? So, um, uh, I just want to look at it from a gender perspective, where... <clears throat> A lot of the times, women are at a disadvantage of um, uh, money matters, you know, in our homes, like I mentioned earlier. So um, uh, my question is, how do we, beyond this, you know, um, uh, the book, how do we ensure that we are educating women who may not necessarily, you know, have access to educational opportunities like employability and all that. How do we extend this beyond? Because um, a lot of the times they are the ones sitting in the homes with children as well to educate children while, you know, in our African settings, men are out there working. So my question really is how do we extend this to employability, you know, and access to finances? Mm, I'll, I'll leave you to answer that. <laughs> <Before>. <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the things that I definitely try to do is to think about what other options are available to me. Because again, with money, um, if you look at passions and, and areas of interest, and then you start in those areas, it's an easier thing because new habits are not easy. So what, where do moms hang out? Where do they, what do they do? They love to have a, a blather. That's why we did it this style, the, the conversational cafes is, you're definitely going to have someone come around over a cup of tea, have a meal together, and then normalizing the conversation is the most important thing. We have to start being okay with asking for help, which we don't do often enough. But something I've found on my entrepreneurial journey actually that's interesting is as women, we take so, this is probably true for men as well, especially as, as Mama Eva was talking about um, men of color going through this additional issue. But with time, rejection becomes so much that you give up on yourself. So you've started a business, you're being judged, there's racism going on, you give up easily. So normalizing conversations is really important. We need to start talking about being upset, we need to start talking about the rejections, and then we can start talking about rape. what solutions can we do? How do we get this going? And having more conversations, I think, is the most important thing. Um, in terms of managing money specifically, I mentioned earlier that I, we, we became vulnerable really, we became vulnerable when we came here, when we had been secure in the third world, in the dark continent, and we had to come here to get vulnerable. I remember being so, so scared. I was so, so scared that money was not in my, I was not in control. And I was so determined, I got so angry 
and so determined that it would never happen again. So I, I became obsessed with the topic and I, I started learning and I started thinking, how am I going to make sure this never happens to me or my offspring or anyone that's my friend? So where your passion lies is where you're going to likely change habits or that. So if we want to help women and young people, we need to find them where they are. You need to go to the playgrounds. If you're going to help Africans, you need to go to church, folks, because <laughs> we are in church. <laughs> So uh, I was listening to something uh, Professor Mukami was saying, and she was saying, when the, when, when the public services are looking for Africans, they call us hard to reach. But when an, an African commits a crime, they're at the address in 30 minutes. And I found that really profound. So they know where to find us when they need to find us. <laughs> but they don't know where to find us when they want to engage with us. So if anyone is trying to do a piece of work in anything, it doesn't have to be money any project you're trying to do, think about the mindset of the person that you're trying to work with. Where are they likely to hang out? What do they eat? What makes them happy? What makes them tick? And try and work around those things. I've had to learn that with funding as well. <laughs> you have to make sure it can't be all about you. It has to be about the person that you, and you have to make, make it work. You have to make sure that your project is going to tick a box for them and then make sure it's going to deliver value and then they can say something that works. So start from the bottom and think about where are the passions of this person's at? How do I come to their level? Mm. Wonderful. I think that's the time up. Thank yeah, the bad Thank cops. You. I can't introduce myself as a bad cop and then let us run 25 <laughs> minutes over. I've got to earn the title. A real um, bad cop, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much to the Radio Jambo. Okay, there was lots to unpack there, and I think that those conversations should carry Thank on you, happening. Man. I think it was Eva, I couldn't see I had my back to you, but somebody said, how does the book get into libraries? We can, we can connect this book to libraries through an organisation called the Scottish Library and Information Council and try and get, you know, the conversations happening in libraries, and that would be a start, so we can all join in with this. Um, right, I'm delighted now to introduce to the stage the guest speaker for the day, which is Dr. Mukami McCrum. Is Dr. McCarley here, yes. and is she mic'd up? Hello. <laughs> and we'll check oh. your microphone. Is it? I think so, yeah. yeah. It's good. Good to go. Am I alone on the platform? I can come and sit yes. with Jonathan. Go and sit with Doctor. <laughs> I'm in <a> company. How are you? Wow! I, I really don't know where to start. Uh, apart from saying thank you very much, Tina and Jonathan, for inviting me, it, it's a great honour, um, and actually to be involved in this project. Uh, and I think also the, the we library um, for accepting my grandson who came and ran around your library all the time when, <laughs> when the interview was going on, which is really indicative of the way we are. Uh, we, the, one of the challenges I found when I came here is you could not take your children to anywhere you wanted to. You know, you had to make formal arrangements and. Um, and I think I remember phoning you to ask you, is it okay if I bring my grandson to, to the, mm, because then I would need to arrange for more childcare and all that. But anyway, here we are. And um, let me start making a few disclaimer. When I say um, Africa, I'm quite uh, sure you all know, like I do, that it's a continent. So I'm not really, Sorry. It's not working. Yeah. It's, it's quite low. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Yeah. The Africa is a continent. It's not just one country. It's not one culture. It's not one group of people. But for the purpose of our meeting here, um, I'm making a generalized uh, statement. Also, when I say something about my experiences or our experiences in Scotland, I'm not saying that all oh, Scotland is a bad place and all people are horrible. I'm saying we can do better. There are things that we ought to do better. And, and as a next teacher, did you want to introduce me, by the way? No. <laughs> as a next teacher, one of the things I used to say is that 
when you teach children the right thing, regardless of their color, you're uplifting the whole humanity. If you teach the correct history, not the biased history, it's not just my children that will benefit from lack of discrimination. White children will benefit by learning the correct version of history. And that goes for everything. Uh, the other disclaimer is that, and I support um, what Mariam was saying, when I, speak about, when I say women have a hard time, I don't mean all men are bad and we hate men. I have a son I love to beat, my late husband, and my father, my brother, and many other people in my life who have meant a, a, a great difference, and great friends uh, who have been there who don't call brother any time. People you can call at 3 a.m. and they don't ask you what time do you think this is, you know. Uh, so, so it's not, but really what I'm saying, there are issues, there are things that are not quite the way we ought to, ought to be and how we should be living together and we need to do better than that. Um, I am really grateful to the panel, all the people who spoke before. You, you kind of uh, already uh, spoke my speech, which is in a way uh, good because it affirms that the togetherness of our experiences uh, and the validity of what we have gone through and we go through, and most of all, the, the fact that we are still standing and, and thriving. Yeah, I think. Since I'm here sitting, I just wanted to have brief description and introduction of, of who Mukami is. So, hello? Hello? Yeah. yeah. So, Mukami is a prominent member of our society and a community leader. She's a professor, a Kenyan woman who has lived in Scotland most of her life. She's a grandmother of two wonderful children who inspire her the dreams of better and just world. Her achievements have been recognized in various forums, including being awarded MBE for her work and campaigns. Last year, 2023, she was awarded a lifetime achievement recognition by Scottish Black Professionals Scotland and professionship by Glasgow Caledonia University. Her professional life started as a teacher in Kenya, where she taught three years before relocating to Scotland. Her career includes working as a race equality officer, CEO of Central Scotland Racial Equality Council, and a policy manager for the Scottish Government Gender Equalities and Violence Against Women and Girls. So briefly, that is who we have here on stage. Thank you very much for that. Um, when you asked me to, to <coughs> send you a paragraph to, to describe myself, and I was trying to edit it quickly, I removed one thing from that. I used to say I'm an African one woman who lives in Scotland. And I started wondering, why do I have to say that? It's obvious. When, when I wake up in Kenya, I never say I'm an African or a black woman. I'm just who I am. And I think in terms of universality, I should be who I am, wherever I am. There are identities in our lives that change all the time. I grew up from being a daughter to becoming a mother of a daughter, uh, to, uh, to becoming a wife. Um, but essentially, I remain who I am. My, my people, my people who are the Kikuyu people of, of, of the, uh, the slopes of Mount Kenya. I became a teacher in Kenya, but my career ended up in civil service. So, so the, I did some of the identities we collect along the way change. But others remain who we are, and I think that's what I, uh, and, and I'm using that because also, um, you asked me to, 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 to say why I feel strongly that we should promote our culture. And by culture, I mean who we are, the values we have, the, the, the ideas, the, the ideology we have. But it's not to say it's exclusively and it's the best of all, 
But because where we are at the moment, you find our children grow up. My, my children are African Scots. They describe themselves as African Scots, and that's what they are because their father was Scottish and I'm African. I always describe myself as African or Kenyan because that is an identity which will not change wherever I live in the world. If I go to North Pole, I'll see you be an African woman. Um, but the reason that to me it is important for, for, for me to teach them even more than I was taught. Nobody, I never woke up and, and my mother said, listen, you are a Kenyan woman, you are a girl, you are, you are an African woman. It was, it was not necessarily. You breathe your culture, you, you, you take it in with the milk of your mother as you grow up. But when you're here, when it's, when it's seen as a subculture, something exotic, something backward, something perhaps not on par with other cultures of the world, it becomes more important for us to, to talk about our languages, our history, our music, our food, even if we're not using it every day. And that is because if you don't have roots, if you don't have a base, it's so easy to be knocked about. People who build houses tell me, if you have a very strong foundation, you can be, build the tallest building and it will stand. The winds, the storm will blow it about. And that is what we are like when we know our story. A long time ago, uh, an Aboriginal Australian woman told me that the reason they claim the lost children, the children who are stolen, is that they, their souls are lost until they know their story. Where, where their, their story is their roots. Their sto whatever they see as the story of creation. And I think it's the same of all people. When I was in Kenya, what I, was, I found amazing when I was growing up there is the Scots celebrated Burns Night every January. And, and, and Haggis was flown from George Street all the way to Nairobi so that they could celebrate. So if I wanted to eat Ugali and Sukumawiki, why was it seen as not so good? And why did I believe? Or why did you believe our food is not good enough? Why did you not believe, you did not believe aloe vera is good until you bought it from body shop? <laughs> why? This is we need to be asking about. How, how, how do we go into, why do we move from using something our grandmothers use and cherish to deciding it's not good enough? We have to only use this one, which is uh, 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 maybe perhaps packaged uh, and labeled in a different way from the way our grandmothers did. And that's the same as our education. And it's the same now coming to money. Our relationship with money again, um, when people talk about butter trade, it's almost like, you know, it's that old system. But still it exists in many ways. In, in, you know, people, if you go to some places in Africa, you look around and you say, how on earth do people live here? How do they survive here? And you look, if you look deep down, it's because of their relationship with perhaps means of production. Let's not just call it money. The, 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 the fact that the exchange, and I've noticed now, Scots are doing a lot of that. Almost every little village has got a, a community hub where you can exchange tools, go and borrow tools from somebody else. You don't have to buy things. But, you know, we did that a long time ago. You just go and knock on the door, you tell somebody, my, my, my axe is not sharp enough, can I borrow yours? And I go and I'll come and bring it back. And those kind of exchange of sharing of resources is money. It's valuable money, but, but it's not currency, as David was describing it with a hole in it. That came later. That is the, the currency I understood of my parents or, or my mom, where they would, build, they would build one woman's house this month and collect money and build the U.S. the next week, the next month, next month. And then we kids coming from school and you see your house from a distance with a tin roof shining, you know, the, the corrugated, because we used to have the, the houses, such houses, and they were always catching fire, you know. People are always getting burned because the fire was inside. And women decided that a corrugated, uh, and also you could trap, you could catch water, the engine, so, so you had, it served two purposes. 
But the one woman on her own could not afford to, well, you could after you wait for a long, long time. But the energy, the synergy of building together meant that they could um, quickly <coughs> build 10 houses uh, for different women. Uh, we called it Harambe. It's, it's called Harambe now in a different context. And we also learned from that conservation, and I've written, I've said something about it in the book, how we would, used to be told stories, and this back to our culture. Our stories were about entertainment. They were also about education, and were about, they were about warning. Now, I say all my grandson's stories, but I have to dilute them a little bit because he really gets scared when I talk about giants and um, shooting birds. And uh, so now I talk about, I uh, say the, the bird fell, uh, you know, flying so fast it fell, but it, then it, it, it flew up again because he said, the birds should not die. And he's right, we're talking about conservation, different stories, different ideas. So those stories <coughs> are, are very important in terms of uh, deciding where we're going in the future. We, we also, the one thing I wanted to say, now coming here, some of the issues I found were opening bank accounts was an issue because you didn't have a lot of money. And um, I remember a friend of us uh, telling, uh, telling me that, um, why did you open a bank account in Kostofen when you're, when you're just a teacher? You, you know? And I said, well, in Kenya, teachers were the power of good people. You know, we had status. And he said, no, 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 no. Open your bank account in Nidri. The bank manager will love you because you'll be the one who is with the richest people in that area. <laughs> if you open a bank account with your little money in, in, in Kostofen, the bank manager is always going to give you a hard time. And he did, because we had a bridging loan. Eva was talking about mortgages, and trying to deal with that was a real nightmare. And Friday, Friday afternoon, we would receive a letter reminding us about an overdraft. And we'd have a very bad weekend until Monday morning when I would phone and say, why did you send it on Friday? <laughs> why can you know, wait until Monday so I can phone you? But th those kind of things were always a, a bit of a, a, an issue. And getting credit cards, again, it was uh, something we did not understand. George was talking about using the credit card. I was scared of them. But I usually I got a credit card out of desperation because my friend and I got stranded in Geneva. Uh, you won't believe that. We had five francs between us. So we used one franc to phone home. Uh, we had our ticket to come back home, but um, um, we had gone for a conference and we had just left in the hotel to catch our flight the following morning. And we had only a few francs to, to catch the, uh, the tram to go to the airport. So we could not buy tea or food. And uh, it's then I realized, well, I think one has to have a credit card. But the question I, I wanted to ask, I'm really happy now that being here, we are celebrating something. Most of the time when I'm sitting on platforms like this, I'm either complaining about violence against women, I'm complaining about FGM, or others are campaigning about it. We are talking about racism. But we rarely get a chance to celebrate something wonderful like this. And I think George is right, some of the mistakes Trial and error, you know, a shot in the dark, you know, we did, we went through. If there were, we didn't have, it, there were not enough people around me who were not struggling like we were. When people say we don't support each other, I think we need to redefine that because it's a question of what we should be asking. How can I support you? What, what do you need? How, define support because sometimes it, a woman said, all I want is for people to respond to my, if I send an email, just tell me yes or no. Silence, that, that would be enough support. She's running a project. Um, I don't have enough time, so I, can, I need to I notice I have to go. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is how we adapt to difficult situations. And one of the things that we do now, and I want to link it to another question I want to ask us, is we do table banking. When I talked about cultures, uh, uh, there is people talk about supremacy of cultures, but when you try to open, when we still do table banking, I don't know how, whether people know about table banking here, uh, or we call it different names, different parts of the, of the world. 
you collect a group of you collects money and you give it to one person every month and um, uh, I think the yeah the the circles circles yes yeah <coughs> but you try to open a bank account you, uh, and you say you are a circle and you're trying to 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 and you're going to we, we, we I know people have been really struggling to open bank account because the banks do not understand that system of um, um, investment, they call it investment. So, when are you guys going to open our own bank account? African Bank in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> because we need a bank, we need bankers that understand how we deal with money, how we work. And the other thing is, when are we going to get rid of this massive fear we have about trusting uh, our, each other on finances. I, I know we do that for, we don't trust each other for very good reasons. But people who do business tell me that you have to take a risk. So we have to take a risk, and we have to take a risk because there are ways of making people accountable now. What we have to do is not keep quiet. If somebody runs away, if, we, if, if five of us collect money and somebody runs away with it, we, we go after that money. Now we can do that. You know, we don't just say we're not going to invest because people will run with our money. I think it's very important we start discussing those kind of things critically. Being critical of ourselves, but being kind to ourselves as well. And the last point I, I wanted to mention is um, we are in Scotland in the 21st century, and we know that uh, so many of our brothers and sisters are trying to come to Scotland or to, to UK because so, sometimes we have given the wrong impression of how we, we are doing well. We, we are not doing too badly. You know, people, on, uh, we have electricity, we have water, we have many things around. But I think we need to find a way of supporting people when they come here. With, because they are not going to stop coming until things get better back home. But telling people don't come, things are bad, they will still come. So we do need to find, I don't know who, whether it's lobbying the government or who we need to work, to work with, but we do need to deal with um, the massive problem, for example, care workers. People are coming here and they are suffering because they don't know who to go to and they don't want to admit their suffering. And to me, every time I hear either somebody has died or somebody has disappeared, I feel really sad because we have to be each other's keeper and we have to be the family here. If you are home, you know your family network where you can go for help. We don't have those family networks, so we have to be each other's family. And I think Tena has started by making a family of people who are interested in finances. Because money is important, but it should not define us all the time. Thank you very much. The role I have has to respond. And when Dr. Makami is saying such important things and asking those important questions, you just listen. And that's a conversation, I think, that maybe Tina and Uncle Llewellness want to kind of take forward to some really interesting ideas. And thank you so much. Um, I think that the final official speaker today is, is um, Caroline Clark, who is from the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, which is the body that put this, uh, the Heritage Fund, sorry, I know it's, it's a set subtle differences. Um, so I'm going to invite to the stage uh, Caroline. So I am going to be super brief uh, after some amazing speakers who have been mad to try to follow um, with more profound words. So I just wanted to got my speech here, I'm not going to be reading it. I wanted to extend my thanks to everybody involved in this project. It's been an absolute privilege and an honour to hear about all of the different stories here today. It's interesting coming from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. If you think about people going in and buying their tickets at the supermarkets on a Saturday, and a little bit of that money comes together 
three years ago, we invested it in this project and then look at the rewards that everybody is reaping from that. So there's an interesting parallel story going on. Um, I was, it's been a very emotional afternoon, really moving, and I think the power of what you've pulled together here is immense. So I think I came here thinking it was going to be the celebration of a launch of a book, but what I'm hearing is the celebration of a start of a movement, an African finance movement. Your ambition is so tangible, so I hope that I can um, hear more about ideas that you have for the future, uh, not just from the, group, the groups organising this project, but actually I can see there's probably lots of people in this room who might have ideas that um, we could talk about further. Um, the words I'm really taking away from looking at you, Eva, are challenging but beautiful. I think that's really encapsulated everything that I've heard today, and I'm going to just call it call a halt because I know the, the time that will make Stuart happy, and that's, that's something I want to do. Um, and we can move on to the next part of the programme. So, yeah, just to thank you very much from us at the National Lottery Fund. It's an absolute honour to see what you've done with our investment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, that's actually technically really where, where it ends for the online audience. Who I, I hope you've been able to join in. I'm looking right at you and down the camera. Um, I hope it's worked for you um, if you've not been able to be in the room today. And the sound was sometimes up and down, but you can't not have got the energy and the love for this project that's been in this room. I'm sure that was very clear all the way through. So we're going to say goodbye to the people who are um, uh, online. And um, Tina, do you want to give, give a quick wave to that camera there? Because there's people who, who, are, who are probably hoping to see you one last Thank time. Thank you so much for this being with us online. It's <laughs> Thank you. OK, bye. Bye, everybody. That just leaves us in the room, and there's still plenty of us. Um, and the books are here.